All right. Um, ooh, there's some somebody <laughs> putting a block over the screen. Okay. So um, I would like to start with sort of first uh, takeaways. So first impressions, not necessarily just go over the, the notes that we put in, but just uh, your first um, thoughts uh, um, hosting these sessions. I would like to know from each of the moderators how, what the, how their session was. Um, if it was, uh, uh, did you get some new insights? Um, how was the discussion? Who would like to start? Yeah, I can start. Uh, yeah, I think you. maybe I start with something. Um, I think from Malmö said uh, at the very end of our very lively discussion, uh, it would be better to share more experiences between projects because there's obviously so much uh, knowledge available. And I think this is uh, very much in the spirit of today's meeting that we are sharing these experiences and uh, it's it's really great to bring this knowledge together. So yeah, we discussed um, and um, there were a, lot, a few more things that um, we can contribute now. So you were hosting the session on- uh, I was hosting on, yeah, exactly. Ensure diversity and inclusivity in communities and allow experiments. Those yeah. were our two sessions. Yes. And uh, uh, did you have a big group to, to discuss this with? To be honest, I uh, don't know how big the group was. I didn't show maybe our note taker saw that, but I think probably around 20 people. All right, that's a good, uh, good amount of people. That's nice. Um, 22. 22 people. Ah, okay. <laughs> All right, that's good. That's good. Um, so, um, Imre, how, what was your session like? Uh, we had a, a small but very enthusiastic bunch of people. We were, I think, nine or ten. Uh, but it also enabled us to have a more in-depth uh, discussion. So everybody had the chance to talk about their experience. We had representatives from uh, uh, two municipalities, one from Serbia and uh, uh, two from uh, Budapest. We also had representatives from researchers, but also from the academic uh, sphere, uh, from universities. So, it also highlighted uh, an interesting aspect of co-creation and that is education and training. And one of our key findings, if I already spoil, spoiler, one of the findings is that uh, you don't only need to educate uh, or exchange knowledge with citizens, but also transport planners, urban planners also would need education on how to deal with citizen participation. So they understand uh, the needs of the citizens and also they are not skeptical about the uh, various ideas that citizens may come up with. Okay, great. And Graham, what was your session like? That's funny, Emre. Uh, we, we had a similar discussion in our group where we were uh, talking about the secondary benefits of co-creation and bringing uh, a diverse people into a room and how actually learning about the experiences of citizens uh, in a town can be maybe more beneficial in the long term for uh, civil servants, servants than maybe even the impact of the uh, ultimate piloted mobility solution that just bringing people into the room can have those long-term benefits. Uh, we had a good discussion. Uh, we had, I think, about 12 people. Um, I think what we found was uh, there's quite a bit of overlap between the two messages that we covered, which were uh, be where the people are and, and look at the big picture. And oftentimes the recommendations we came out with kind of straddled that line between these two um, big messages. Yeah, uh, that, that's the same thing we found actually that there was a lot of interlink between the messages. Well, that's good, good to know, right? That there's, there's, uh, everything is connected in that sense. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Joe, you were uh, had uh, maybe the least connected to, to messages or uh, was that a... Uh, oh, um, well, I think our messages are connected. And let's say we had a great discussion. I wish we had the whole afternoon. Um, with a number of policymakers and researchers, et cetera. Uh, so I think the, uh, we had a lot of reality checks to say, how do you deal with conflicts? How do you deal with different agendas? 
uh, I learned something new today, which is that the Germans, we all think, oh, well, they're very you know, law-abiding people, very respectful, but you put them in behind the wheel of a SUV and there is no stopping them. <laughs> it's the Wild West. Uh, yes. And so then we had the suggestion, uh, well, actually, let's look at the underlying needs of people. And these SUV drivers, clearly, you know, they uh, do not need to drive an SUV. We should you know, supply them with some free uh, therapy or something, and then they can all get on a bicycle. I'm joking, but these are half serious results because then uh, we have the challenge to say, okay, we are dealing with uh, complex communities there are, uh, or groups of people. There, there is conflict, there is confusion, there is paranoia. There is the very complex power, uh, structures of administration and urban planning and urban infrastructure. Who can understand these things? Even the, the, the people inside the town hall, they can understand their piece, but not all the other pieces. So uh, there is a big question, should we educate uh, to improve the skills of everybody? Shall we uh, maybe create a, a new section of um, uh, how do we say, barefoot community planners. Things that we were talking about in the 1980s uh, are still going around and around. And maybe we have better technology, but we also have more uh, awareness of the, of the challenges. Somebody mentioned the dilemma, meaning a problem which you cannot easily solve. Uh, and I think uh, Copenhagen is in the city plan is one which is now working with dilemmas and saying to people, sorry, we have a dilemma here. It's a real problem. Nobody knows how to solve. Can you help? And I thought, yeah, this is a great example of how to do it. And of course, coming from Copenhagen, we, we look for models here. Uh, in Manchester, for one, we have um, uh, a new idea, totally radical. How do you, uh, it's called bringing services together. And you say, okay, so before services were not working together, right, now let's bring them together. That's a great idea. Uh, and, you know, we thought of this 30 years ago, but these things take time. So, um, well, what can I say? Uh, we are, there is a session directly after the close of this conference uh, to look in more depth and detail at this government, government question. If anyone is interested, I'll put the link on the chat line. Um, you can still sign up. So yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, so Kristen, maybe you can sort of wrap up this round of the, uh, oh, and then we go into detail uh, uh, on the recommendations themselves. But what was uh, how was your session, and uh, what were sort of the your first insights or new things that you uh, took away? You're still muted. I hope this works. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so we had a pretty big uh, group. We had about 17 people. And uh, actually, at first, um, it seemed like the two messages. So I did the benefits of the neighborhood level and education and professionalization and co-creation and participation. It's a mouthful. Um, and uh, there were a lot more overlaps there than I think we initially thought there might be. Um, so a lot of the ways that we can sort of leverage the benefits of the neighborhood level are to uh, make sure that we have people who facilitate it properly and, um, and that we have good methods that bring all of the people in um, who need to be heard to have a representative cross-section of, of the society and the, at the neighborhood level. So um, one of the main messages that was coming out um, was basically to uh, set the expectations from the beginning. We want to take a democratic approach. Um, this isn't about maintaining a, a consensus in co-creation uh, or about anyone sort of uh, fighting for the loudest voice, but um, that we come to solutions that everyone can be happy with to some degree and at least not completely unhappy with. Um, and uh, also the message I think to just be daring to be creative 
when we're working at the neighborhood level, we have more uh, creative license um, to experiment, to prototype, to, um, yeah, to find uh, quick wins and gain the trust of the local residents. I think that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, so you added uh, the, the purple uh, 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 post-its are from, from that session, right? So they're in the two yeah. uh, sections of, in, in the above. Of course, I think what, what we can learn from, I think what I've heard so far from you is that, well, of course, everything is connected in that sense. So all the aspects that, because I've heard mentioning um, in the session, um, where I was part of your session, Kristen, where we talked about be where the people are, where, where we identified that as, of course, a, a big message in itself that, that um, Graham was working with in, the, in these sessions. So there is a lot of, and we're talking about experiments, then that's something that is, of course, also dis discussed in the other, uh, in the other sessions. Um, so I'm, I'm very curious of what are sort of the big uh, takeaways or the sort of new additions to the big messages, especially when we're looking at specific agents or um, target audiences that we um, want to address. So since we are sort of a, um, a mix of policymakers, um, people that working on the neighborhood level um, and everything in between are sort of um, in this these sessions, I'm very curious of Sort of what are the differences of approach and or the different questions that everybody would have um, related to these uh, to these topics um, so maybe um, Susanna maybe you can uh, kick off your because um, there's quite a lot of green <laughs> uh, green the... and one orange that I also put there it's not uh, that one is more important than the other but let's start with the orange one because I think that this is something that was not really uh, very much included before um, this is uh, something time is a very important issue when it comes to uh, experimentation really um, and I think that's very true because as we've heard uh, for instance, from our side, uh, from the Met uh, Metamorphosis Project, if these uh, temporary changes don't last long enough, then you don't give uh, the people uh, enough experience uh, to, ex yeah, to, to experience them, but also to change their behavior in a sense. And the same is probably also true uh, with the involvement of the city council. So they also need uh, enough time. And that leads uh, immediately to this next point, actually, that um, it is very important to find the right department uh, in the city council. And that sometimes we are working, or we were working, for instance, with uh, transport people, whereas uh, it, it would be another department that is much more suited for, for this uh, particular experiment and to get them on board again uh, needs time. So that was um, something that I thought is very true and that should definitely go into our recommendation. So allow enough of time, enough of time. And um, another thing was that um, that actually fits both uh, in, into this allow experiments, but also in the diversity uh, area, is don't exclude uh, hard to reach groups uh, from the beginning. Uh, so for instance, we heard about uh, an example where I think in Malmö or the Streets for Children uh, uh, project, now Cities for People project, um, there were, uh, disabled people involved, uh, maybe not a group that you would uh, normally think about involving, uh, and some very nice uh, projects uh, and experiences grew out of that. So uh, again, um, this is also ob obviously important for diversity and inclusivity, but I think it also fits in this area of uh, experiment with hard to reach groups. And, um, let me move over. Uh, yeah, there are, um, there's uh, one key issue, I think, that we uh, identified uh, in this area of uh, ensure diversity and inclusivity in communities. And it is that, uh, in general, uh, road space is not fair. 
Uh, so, and this is true, obviously, not only for the fact that most of the space uh, is used for motorized vehicles and uh, not so much for pedestrians and cyclists and all other road users, but we know that uh, it's also not fair when it comes to women because uh, men are much more riding cars and obviously children and uh, minority groups. Again, here, this links in with uh, involving a uh, hard to reach group. So, this is something we should really be working on, uh, make uh, our roads and our space much fairer. And uh, another issue that was brought up by Alan Wong, our colleagues who was involved in all these ethics problems is that um, a lot of the time uh, what stands behind ethics or what ethics means, um, what are the guiding factors behind them are not necessarily understood by um, all participants and definitely not by um, citizens. And so this is something uh, that uh, needs work still. And uh, I think the third one uh, is yeah, to develop processes uh, to understand uh, all these problems, including ethics and so on. So I think this, this is the main um, things that we can take away from our session. Good, thank you. Um, I have to have a, take a look at the time. So uh, maybe we have 10 minutes left to do the, the rest of the going through them. So uh, um, if we could speed them up a little bit. Um, uh, Graham, maybe you can uh, take over uh, the be where the people are because that's in the middle of my screen right now. So. <laughs> Happy to be in the middle. Um, sure. So um, going through these, I'm going to read them and see if I need to explain. I don't think I do. Uh, when working with communities, keep digging and bring in all affected people. And that's about, I think, also getting everybody involved, isn't it? And as you dig into a challenge or an issue, you might find more and more and more groups. And while it's best to do this before you start co-creation to have as many people on board from the beginning, you might find yourself adding more and more affected people as you go on. Um, next one is, I think, a bit more complex. Listen carefully and speak clearly about tasks. Um, I think listening carefully and speaking clearly are, uh, you, you should unpack that a little bit. Listening carefully means taking notes and being, uh, and then so that at your next meeting, you could present the findings from the previous meeting so you can properly. Uh, iterate and develop an idea uh, without kind of falling back or changing your mind from previous decisions. Um, and speaking clearly is uh, not only being sp speaking clearly about tasks, especially when you're um, co-implementing a solution with community members being really clear about whose job is what, but also um, avoiding academic lexicon and speaking in language that is universally understandable as much as possible. Um, and then the third one here is different tech data and interventions for different folks. Um, this is a really interesting one. Oftentimes we're in this dichotomy about uh, engaging people uh, through uh, online or engaging people in person and how you reach different groups. But one, one person from our group mentioned um, that, that in his project, they use a variety of different data sources and presented it in a variety of different ways. And each of these different ways of collecting data or types of data that collecting or how it's being presented uh, could bring in different members, different aspects of the community, uh, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, and then uh, our other one is, Maya, would you mind scrolling down? I don't, uh, I think it's down. Oh, yeah. There it is. Look at the big picture down at the bottom. Um, and again, I think we're straddling two of these, these two different ideas, but uh, making, ma making interactions convenient and accessible to uh, bring in uh, a variety of different people um, to get a bigger, better understanding of that big picture. But I think that could just as easily fall into the um, be where people are as well. Uh, and the other one, uh, number two, was uh, make it interesting and relevant to a large group of people. And again, this kind of relates to that technology one where uh, people are interested in different things. And if you wanna get a variety of inputs from a variety of people, don't uh, do a single track on your project, but see how you can add levels of, um, of uh, interactions and involvement to bring in a, a range of people on a specific pilot. 
Uh, so don't make it all that one thing, but maybe monitoring can bring in different people or promoting it will bring in different people or uh, actually doing the nuts and bolts of an intervention will bring in a different set of people and make it interesting to them. And then the third one is putting citizens at the core. Uh, mobility is not just mobility. This idea that we live in complex systems uh, and we might find ourselves addressing challenges that don't on the face of it look like they're mobility challenges in order to overcome mobility challenges for members of the community. Uh, and then, you know, not being strictly uh, slavish to our agenda, but to bring in the agenda of our community members as well and incorporate it into our ideas. And that's it for me. Maya, I think you're, there you are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had to find my unmute button again. <laughs> Thank you, Graham. Um, Joe, you jumped out for a bit, but maybe you can do a quick overview of um, your results. Uh, like I said before, we, we have a um, still a, 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 sh a short talk uh, um, from uh, GG Move uh, uh, coming up. So I would like to wrap up this uh, quickly. So. Um, um, Joe, could you Sorry, walk us uh, through? Uh, tech problem. Uh, yeah, that's all right. Let, okay. Which one do you like to start? The, um, uh, let's see, the evaluate okay. one well, or the... Let, let's start with evaluation. Yeah. And wow, oh, there's some professional evaluators in the room, so I have to, you know, give way to their expertise. Um, but um, just to say, here is one small example to get through the you know very general abstract words that go around and around. Uh, so first of all, we have the example of uh, road closing, but from another point of view, it's road opening uh, to pedestrians, closing to cars, opening to pedestrians. So every time we talk about road closing, we have to say, wait a minute, let's reframe that uh, and so on. Uh, and okay, so, one evaluation is to say, did we get this street open? Yes, okay. Did we give, did the people grow the skills to open the street? Uh, citizens, uh, local groups, um, policymakers, and so on. Uh, and then we say, okay, did we help or mobilize some structural changes or strategic policies in this city uh, to help people open streets uh, like uh, money? and uh, regulation and permissions and all this stuff. And even as uh, somebody mentioned, you know, the waste management truck, it has to get through. How do we manage that? Do we talk to the waste management people and, and so on? And then if we are really uh, doing a, a, a great thing, then we, okay, have we achieved structural changes in all cities around Europe? Uh, and well, this is a big thing, which we, is beyond our, frame of project. But then there is a, another note yet to come up, I think. Um, people say, okay, uh, we can evaluate the road closing, uh, sorry, the, the road opening, uh, but how do people feel? Do they use it? Uh, and um, what happens after the project is shut, is closed? Um, and so on and so on. Now, there are no fixed answers to any of those questions. My thinking is from experience, if we can be open and we say, okay, uh, and this comes to our experience in Manchester in the Looper project, actually, uh, which I could talk about, you know, for, for some hours, but just in, in, in a few seconds to say, okay, so some people really want this road uh, opened to people and closed to lorries. And other people say, no, 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 you cannot do this, you know, because, because it's complex and the lorries have to get through to the business and the jobs and the shops and so on. Uh, and actually, in our case, the citizens wanted this, the policy makers and the chairperson of the planning. And About expectations, so manage expectations. And this can be addressed in large part by making it clear we want, we aim for a democratic approach and, uh, and not consensus. So, um, and also we need to accept that there will be conflicts and manage the different views. So um, maybe, you know, not having groups together at first who would definitely disagree with each other, but listen to them, 
separately so that we can really understand what the challenges are and then think of a way how we can bring them together in a constructive discussion rather than a head to head <laughs> match potentially. So um, yeah, those are our main recommendations for this. All right, great. So um, I will stop sharing my screen just to go over and see everybody's faces again. Um, so of course, I think we can talk about these uh, uh, for a lot longer. Um, but of course, this is also already, uh, we're two and a half hours in uh, this uh, meeting. Um, and I want to make sure that uh, there's still uh, time um, to um, listen to Luana uh, Bidaska from um, DJ Move. We uh, invited her to uh, uh, to talk about the future of of uh, future for neighborhood mobility. Sorry, um, and after her talk, we will uh, come back and sort of do a wrap up, and and I will share um, some resources uh, for everybody. Uh, Luana. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you, Maya, uh, for inviting me to, to this uh, meeting today. Um, I would also like to congratulate the projects for uh, their, their achievements and results. Um, I think it's nothing less than impressive uh, to advance the knowledge uh, working with cities on, on these um, very important areas, uh, citizen engagement and co-creation um, has gained a bit of a life of its own right now. And it's uh, almost on everybody's lips, uh, wherever you look. So um, um, definitely some, some nice takeaways to, to share beyond the community. I have a few slides, which I will try to project on the screen right now. Um, just uh, to let you know, my internet connection is not the most stable one, but uh, nevertheless, um, uh, it, it does connect back quite quickly, so bear with me in case uh, you stop uh, hearing me all of a sudden. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know what I can say exactly about the future of neighborhood uh, policy. However, I can say a few things about the urban mobility policy at the EU level and um, the initiatives that we are currently um, working on. Um, and I, I think that you can also find yourself in this presentation, regardless of the fact that it's not necessarily tailored to, to the neighborhood level. Um, as you, I think, as you well know by now, um, the European Green Deal stands as the chapeau communication uh, and the guiding trajectory for all European Union policies and interventions right now, and uh, of course for transport as well. So what is what it does say there for transport is that it should become drastically less polluting, and especially in cities. And a combination of measures should address emissions, urban congestion, and improve public transport. So as you can see, there is a clear mandate, mandate there to, uh, to work on these areas and even ask for uh, ambitious targets for modal shift uh, and, and uh, pro further promoting the sustainable urban mobility plans and concepts. Um, you, may, you may already have participated in this, but uh, just to say the Urban Mobility Days finished just two weeks ago. Uh, and yesterday, the presentations were shared as well as the recordings of the sessions. I would particularly invite you to listen to the opening uh, plenary of the first day and the second days, as well as the closing. Um, there was also a very interesting session on financing and funding opportunities, uh, where you can hear about um, in a lot of detail about uh, the future of Horizon initiatives. Um, I will also touch upon those a bit later, uh, but just to, to draw your attention to that. Uh, the European Mobility Week is another flagship initiative of DG Move, um, and this year the topic was zero emission mobility for all. And despite of COVID-19, we were so very surprised to see how many towns and cities still joined the campaign. Um, I would just uh, also, before moving on, um, launch a plea to you 
uh, to popularize, if you want, uh, the SUMP award and the road safety award competition, uh, which is still open until the 31st of October. So it would be great if you could share this with your community or with your partner cities, maybe not Manchester and Brussels, because they have already taken home an award for road safety and uh, sorry, not road safety, but um, sustainable urban mobility planning. Um, and of course, um, one of the, the most recent uh, resources uh, that has been updated is the Sustainable Urban Mobility Plan Guidelines. And here uh, uh, in 2019, they have also been accompanied uh, by a, quite a comprehensive library of um, guides and practitioner briefings uh, on the various topics um, that underpin sustainable urban mobility, such as electrification or active mobility, access restrictions, mobility as a service, and much, much more. Uh, this year in summer, with the help of uh, two projects, um, actually more projects, I won't be able to name them all, but together with Civita Satellite amongst them, um, a practitioner briefing was done on the COVID-19 and impact it had on urban mobility, a full guide, so a more comprehensive document is going to be published as well. Um, a gender and vulnerable groups um, planning, uh, sorry, briefing document was, uh, uh, was also published uh, recently. Uh, and it seems to be quite popular when looking at the download numbers. Um, and uh, coming soon is uh, a topic guide on freight and logistics planning in urban nodes of the 10T, uh, which is um, uh, bringing uh, the, um, the results of the project Vital Nodes to light. It must be said that for all of these projects, uh, for all of these um, topics, we couldn't have published these guides without the support of, of projects like yours, uh, who are um, really helping uh, closing the feedback loop to policy, if I may say so, but also disseminating and exploiting the results uh, beyond the duration of the project by leaving such um, a legacy, let's say, behind and focusing on good practices and good examples from the implementing cities, partner cities. And as far as I heard, uh, there is also a guide being planned for neighborhood and mobility planning. Um, with the help of Sunrise, the Sunrise project. Moving on, because time is short, um, we are also working hard on the evaluation of the urban mobility package. Uh, so the urban mobility package was launched in 2013, and it really had as its cornerstone, um, at the cornerstone, um, sustainable urban mobility plans but also a document on road safety, logistics, and urban vehicle access regulations. Um, and so far, we have seen that although it had um, it raised the momentum and it really raised the profile for, for planning and the importance of, of having an SUMP, of working together, uh, of redefining and reimagining the relationship a city has with traffic, uh, which is the great added value of this SUMP, this great tool, uh, we still uh, haven't done a lot of progress in other areas. There is still congestion and poor air quality. Um, road collisions are still not a thing of the past in our cities. Um, and there are other challenges to consider as well, apart from this, like um, connectivity with the peri-urban and with the rural areas or the lack of connectivity. Um, but also, most recently, the impact that COVID-19 will have and on the mobility in our cities, on the way we work, on the way we, we consume. Um, there will be a report uh, on the evaluation published at the end of December, um, and the new initiative for urban mobility will be expected in uh, 2021 um, in the second half. Um, this, uh, this evaluation will also be supported by uh, a fact-finding study where we're looking at 126 cities uh, focusing on various uh, domains that we found uh, prioritary. Um, and uh, it will survey, yes, a representative sample. Uh, we would like to, to discuss these, um, um, these results in a validation workshop in uh, January at the beginning of the year, um, yeah, next year. But let's see uh, if, if we don't have any delays uh, because of, of COVID-19. Um, so what is the future for urban mobility? Of course, um, 
investment is one key uh, area and uh, financing and funding uh, is one part i will talk about it a bit later uh, but these two these policy these policy elements um are quite uh, are quite important to to frame the discussion at the EU level to incentivize member states to address it um, uh, from a sustainable angle, and uh, the new sustainable and smart transport strategy, uh, which is the translation of the Green Deal mandate, if you will, or the replacement of the white paper on transport, let's say, um, will be issued in December 2020, looking at all uh, transport mode, but also uh, containing some key urban flagships um, and items there. Uh, the new urban mobility initiative I mentioned already, um, and uh, yeah, maybe also interesting for you to know are the new tools for cities uh, that, well, a tool, not, not tools actually, um, the sustainable urban mobility indicators, uh, which um, has taken the form of a benchmarking tool with uh, indicators, as well as a methodology on how to calculate these indicators. Um, this has been validated also with cities and with experts in the area and is now available uh, for free to be consulted. Um, so I mentioned uh, financing and funding. So of course you you might have heard already of the um, uh, recovery and resilience facility, where an extraordinary amount of uh, an unprecedented amount of uh, financing has been put uh, at the disposal of member states. And what is important to know there is that 37% of this should be uh, climate related expenditure, and 20%, for example, also has to be digital. Uh, member states have to submit their plans, or actually had to submit them by last uh, last week. Uh, there will be several iterations of these plans, uh, and will, a final deadline will uh, um, will be in April for, for these plans. Uh, what is also interesting to know is that the timeline to spend this money is very short, so it's just six years, and uh, therefore um, there is a strong uh, recommendation push to member states to come up with mature projects. So um, if you try to contact cities right now, they might tell you that they're very busy and they don't have time um, to, to participate in events or to fill up surveys because they are busy uh, putting together their priorities, uh, their projects uh, ahead of, of, these, um, of these plans. So definitely a big opportunity there uh, for cities. Um, now, coming back to, to COVID-19, maybe, and uh, this whole um, uh, revolution that I think mobility is going through right now, there are some big opportunities. So maybe we could, could we see some silver linings of, of this whole situation? Uh, could, for example, this uh, major boom um, in, uh, in cycling uh, permanently change cities? Um, this is something that certainly we don't know, uh, but um, uh, it, it's it's important to watch carefully. And I think that the tools that you are, uh, um, let's say, you have experimented with, um, uh, I noted down rules of communication that cannot be estimated, uh, underestimated. I think these are becoming even more important right now, and cities should really uh, try to uh, engage everybody in the process of changing. Um, and uh, uh, redesigning the streets, uh, because you obviously have some very mad voices out there and some uh, very discontent participants to the road. Um, and I put here um, a photo which I found uh, on, the, um, on the Brussels Facebook group, uh, which is opposing uh, the pedestrianization uh, of a green area, a major green area uh, of the city. And uh, the idea is to close it for cars, of course. Um, and one of the major um, uh, discontent is that um, the space will be given to the cyclists. <laughs> so it creates this polarization. I think if you don't, um, uh, if you can also try to control this narrative. So uh, what is what is written here is that um, attention. If you don't. Um, uh, are careful with COVID, they will uh, build even more cycle lanes. Um, 
so this uh, this type of um, this type of discourse is getting quite a bit of traction, I would say, in certain uh, in certain areas on the internet for from people who are quite engaged, I would say, uh, in their community and also quite attached to uh, some old ways of traveling. So it's important for a city to to uh, to know what they want to achieve. To as as it was said before, also be brave. Um, another brave measure that I think will bring some discontent uh, is an announcement which I found from um, the city of Paris earlier this morning, bravely announcing uh, what are the benefits of removing half of the um, um, places for parking, uh, saying that it would free up in Paris up to 65 hectares or three times the, the surface of the Garden of Luxembourg. Uh, so I, I would expect the, the Facebook uh, groups there in Paris to also flare up quite a bit um, after seeing this news. But um, what I'm basically trying to say is that citizen engagement will, will not become less important and especially right now. Um, now, in terms of the research and innovation uh, program, the Horizon Europe, uh, as you well know, uh, there will be uh, quite a few changes, let's say, on the, on the horizon. <laughs> uh, so uh, there will be a work program where we aim to have uh, to continue Civitas uh, and to fit it more towards the future, uh, to continue to have it as a voice <clears throat> to disseminate and exploit results from uh, urban mobility funded projects. Um, we, we have uh, proposed uh, topics in various areas. Uh, however, this will have to be done uh, in, in synergy with the other elements, such as um, the Horizon Partnership on Cities uh, called Driving Urban Transitions, uh, which is co-funded by the JPI Urban, um, well, it's a co-funded partnership um, and it's um, going to be led by JPI Urban Europe. Um, the Horizon Cities mission, um, which is the moonshot uh, to really um, achieve um, uh, climate neutrality in 100 cities by 2030. It's quite an ambitious endeavor. Um, it's not the only mission. There will be one on cancer, on soil, um, on climate change and on oceans. Uh, so it's really a new way of, of doing research and innovation to achieve uh, impact in a short uh, amount of time. It will have to go also beyond research and innovation, so it wants to mobilize funding mechanisms from the Connecting Europe facility or from the uh, Digital Europe program, for example. Uh, now, on the city's mission, there will be more information that will be available uh, in December where a communication, when a communication will be issued. Um, there is also the Green Deal call topic open until the 26th of January, where there is a topic, um, a large, quite a large topic that will bring one project which will uh, support and underpin the implementation of the city's mission but also a topic on green ports and green airports, where there is also um, uh, an urban dimension on the connectivity between these two points. Um, of course, the, the urban mobility uh, knowledge innovation community is the last one to join the EIT. Uh, they started their activities last year. Uh, also tomorrow, they have uh, an event on citizen engagement. Um, so maybe you will be interested to, to also take part in that. And uh, um, maybe if you don't know already the um, Urban Mobility Kick, uh, I advise you well to look at their website. Um, they also issue some small calls uh, for proposals where they finance uh, small projects that have a short duration. So again, they're aiming to achieve um, a lot of impact. Uh, they work in this triple helix approach, uh, so it's it's an interesting community that we hope to learn from and and um, uh, to to see also the change uh, with their support. Um, and finally, the living labs of the GRC. So I thought you might find this interesting. Um, there is an open call for expression uh, to test in a living lab format. So with the, with the help of the scientific community and mimic the um, uh, real life environment um, in, uh, in areas such as mobility, digital or energy solutions. So especially more oriented towards the technical side um, and the technological side of things. But again, you would benefit from the support of a, a big team of science, uh, scientists and researchers in the GRC uh, institutes. So uh, I think this is it from my side. 
Um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, if you haven't already subscribed to our LTS newsletter, I would advise you to do so. Uh, and this way you could also keep in touch with some of the um, initiatives and things I, I mentioned um, in my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Luana. It's very informative. Thank you. Um, I think there is a, um, quite some requests on uh, the links that you presented. Um, if they could be shared um, in another way than in the chat, because people are losing the chat. So uh, I think we can work something out in uh, sharing um, your, uh, your information afterwards. Um, what I will do is uh, I will share my presentation with you. Yes. Uh, and with the organizers. So I hope, yeah, in a follow up email, this could be shared. Yes, yeah. we will distribute that. Thank you. Yes, so um, we're in the last uh, four something minutes of this, uh, this conference. Of course, we could have uh, been speaking a lot longer and a lot more. And hopefully uh, we will manage to do that within maybe a year that we can actually meet face to face and have a face to face conversation, do co-creation uh, together. Um, I noticed in the chat also that there's co-creation has a risk of losing its meaning because it's, um, uh, being used so overtly and we also need to make sure that um, we're not uh, overusing the term um, so we need to be a little bit more precise maybe so that's maybe an ambition that we can all take on um, and see what we actually mean with uh, with co-creation um, as a wrap up I would like to share uh, some resources with uh, with all of you just um, um, of course uh, the project has uh, resulted in uh, quite a few things um, and I would like to give you the opportunity to uh, uh, see them. I, I just lost, oh, okay. <laughs> I lost my uh, slides. Um, can everybody see my screen with the slides? I'm assuming yes, I can't see any. Yes, yes. Yes, great. So um, this is just a, a, a quick overview of the resources that came from the um, uh, from the four projects that we uh, we are created, um, but one thing that is still coming up is the um, the publication that we actually worked on uh, during this conference as well. That's the the ten big messages for co-creation on the neighborhood level. Um, and what we we're doing with that publication is that we um, go into a little bit more depth of what these ten big messages actually entail and uh, and how you could take them on. Um, for uh, future endeavors. Um, but I would like to show you, uh, the, for example, the citizen mobility kit from uh, Cities for People was actually a guideline for how to go through the stages of co-creation with also a lot of tools and methods uh, connected to it. Um, and we also have practice timelines on the, um, uh, on the website that showcase, it's sort of the best practices of the five pilots that have run in, uh, in the project. So, uh, um, Feel, uh, feel free to check that out. Um, we will again share resources also in a, an email afterwards. Um, this was mentioned in the uh, breakout from uh, um, uh, the, uh, on education. Uh, Sunrise has produced an e-learning course um, on, uh, on co-creation. So that's also something to check out and uh, see if you can uh, sort of take something away from that. Um, then Looper has created a step-by-step -step model that's also quite insightful and Metamorphosis has created quite a few fact sheets that are also very convenient resources um, um, for future, uh, um, future co-creators or future uh, uh, designers or uh, city makers or policy makers. So uh, please check those out. Um, and then just to recap the 10 big messages, I will go them, through them quickly are these 10 messages. We all discuss them uh, and after the breakout. Um, again, these will be um, sort of brought together in, a, in one publication that we, uh, we will share with you afterwards. So everybody that participated in this conference will, uh, will get that uh, uh, once we have uh, sort of integrated your, these insights from today um, into uh, the general document that we already have. And hopefully that's something that you, uh, you can learn from and take with you in your future endeavors as well. Um, so I'd like to, first of all, uh, um, 
thank all the moderators for uh, for hosting uh, these breakout sessions. Um, I think uh, uh, there were a lot of the good uh, conversations in these sessions. Um, of course, also the um, the project coordinators that uh, uh, were so good to uh, let me interview them uh, on their projects. Um, of course, Andrea and Luana, thank you for uh, for your talks. Um, and then I see that there maybe are some things in the chat, so I will check those out. Um, yes, I think it's about saving the chat. So if people want to have a chat saved with some links, um, there is now something that you can download there uh, that you at least have some of the links that are already there in the chat. Um, and um, I would love to see you all in the next session, maybe face to face, maybe in another uh, online meeting. Um, but uh, please look, for, look uh, to your inbox um, as you will uh, receive um, some more uh, spam or useful information from our end. Um, thank you all for joining and uh, see you next time.